Hi, my name is Morgan Mercer. I'm the founder and CEO of Vantage Point, and I beat the often path by jumping into a space technology when I don't have a background in it and by training companies to be more empathetic, leveraging virtual reality. Ross Palmer here. Today, we've got a great conversation for you. Morgan Mercer is the CEO of Vantage Point, joining me live here in the studio. She's got a VR product that's being used by big companies right now like IKEA and Hyundai to teach soft skills and also to offer diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as sexual harassment training for the workplace. It turns out her major insight is that VR is an unprecedented tool for walking a mile in somebody else's shoes, so to speak, which means that it's an ingenious way to teach empathy and so many things that are severely lacking in the workforce of yesterday and even today. She's been featured in over 150 major publications and Vantage Point's tagline, while technology can cause apathy, immersive technology can drive empathy and fundamentally make the world more human is something that I don't know about you, but I deeply resonate with. So I'm Ross Palmer. Here's Morgan Mercer. This is Beat the Often Path. Well, that's pretty fascinating right there. This is your 151st media appearance I've seen (laughs) from your website. So you're a seasoned pro at this by now, even though you've only been on this path for, what, five years? Yeah, but I I love it, you know? Yeah. And so before that, you were doing kind of the same thing I'm doing. I have my own digital marketing company, and I help companies. I've also built e-commerce platforms. And that's something that you were doing. You were a digital manager of some kind, and you left all that. You quit all that to do something new. So what happened and why did you do that? Yeah, so one of the things that has always been important to me is impacting the lives of other people. And so for me, it's always been a question of how can I leave something meaningful behind, right? Like what what is my legacy? What am I leaving behind um, at the end of the day in 100 years when somebody writes an autobiography about me? And that was one of the best pieces of advice that I received in university was make your life worth writing about. So when somebody looks at your life, make it worth writing about, do something that's meaningful, do something that's of impact. And that can be a one to 10 impact. It can be a one to 100 impact. It can be a one to 1 million, one to 1 billion impact. It's just really think about how do you incorporate impacting others into your life. And so for me, that was always a guiding principle. I actually study political science and Russian studies because initially I wanted wow. to go into diplomacy. Okay. And then I decided that I'm you not going to make an impact there. <laughs> <Like>, forget <laughs> no. that. Nothing good's going to come That's of funny. that. No, I'm just I'm very direct, and mm. so you know that doesn't always go hand in hand with being diplomatic. Mm. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I, I was like, okay, well, maybe I'll go work for a startup. And um, at the same time, I was also working as a analysts at a agency that did do government contracting. So I got to do kind of like the best of both worlds and explore what the two avenues were. So one was marketing, one was as an analyst and working on government contracts. And I got to to kind of like balance the two. Um, But while I was doing that, I was doing deep soul searching of how am I going to impact the world? And I had, it's funny because there's a saying that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And so I had a mentor that appeared in my life and he founded a company, it's called Live Safe. They recently were acquired, but they're a mobile safety reporting company where literally you press a button and if something happens, like there's an active shooter and you press a button and it alerts all of the um you know, response system, so the police officers, et cetera, to come. Wow. And it's because he and his co-founder had survived a school shooting. And so he was like my first, I call him my mentor, um, and he made me read The Alchemist. And so when I read oh, The I Alchemist- I love that book. It's I know, such a good one. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. It's like the one book that I always go back and reference and I make everyone read. It's my favorite book. Yeah. And so he made me read The Alchemist. And as I was reading The Alchemist, I also had the idea for my company. And I dreamed of it. And I'm not even kidding. I don't come from virtual reality. I don't come from technology. <laughs> just had a vision. Yeah, okay. Exactly. No, literally. I like woke up with wow. the idea. And I was like, it was just such a like resonating feeling where yeah. like, you know, when you have normal dreams and it's like, oh, okay, like that was a dream or, you know, whatever. And then you have ones that like really you're like, okay, I can't let go of that. Like I can't shake that feeling, right? Yeah, like and when I, I was in a mall that was made of marshmallows. Like I was like, mm, man, I got to <laughs> yeah, make that happen. Yeah, you, you got to make a marshmallow mall. Yeah, that, was, yeah. <laughs> that one sticks with yeah. you. Um, Look, we're in LA, all the influencers will come. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. I thought they'd sell Yeah, yeah. I think actually that's a, yeah. a great career. Okay. All right. Cool. <laughs> yeah, so, so I had the dream and, you know, it was uh, this feeling of this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And then I hit this point where my boss found out that I was 
kind of working on it on the side. Secretly dreaming, yeah. Yeah, well, she was like, you know, do you want to do this or do you want to work for this company? And I was like, I want to do my startup. So I quit my job and I moved across the country. And I was like, at the time, didn't have any money. So I sent my stuff on literally a Greyhound train. That's how I moved across the country. And I moved to Los Angeles and I hustled and started my company. That's 2018. So you've only been here for five years. Yeah. And I spent a a year of it in Copenhagen. Okay. During the pandemic. That's awesome. So where were you before? Uh, So I was in Washington, D.C. Oh, okay. Nice. I've heard good things. Never been there. It's Um, amazing. Yeah. It's supposed to be a whole different can of worms. I'm sure it's the polar opposite of L.A. in almost every imaginable way. It is, but it isn't. And that's what's interesting okay. about it. I So I love D.C. because I love Europe. And um, I like to be Me around too. people. Yeah, I love to be around people who have different backgrounds and different Same. walks of life, different experiences. So I like D.C. D.C. is a lot smaller and slower in a lot of ways. But then you also do find pockets of the artistic community, the creative community. You have kind of like your artistic and, cre- and creative neighborhoods. Very similar to L.A. So I think L.A. is just a more scaled out version of D.C. And L.A. obviously has different interest sets than D.C. Right. in some ways. Like so. influencing in marshmallow malls. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, my, favorite part, of the, <laughs> <laughs> my favorite part of the um, the Alchemist, it's been many years since I've read it, but he talks about he, he assigns somebody the task of walking around and looking at all the paintings while holding oil in a spoon. Right. And the first time he's like, look at all the painting. And then he spills the oil. And the second time he's focused on not spilling the oil and then he doesn't see all the paintings. And it's just the trick to life is to somehow do both is to not spill the oil, but also recognize the the beauty that's around you. And that is, I remembered that for many, many years. I thought, yeah, what a great metaphor, right? You have to keep it together. You have to make money and do things in this uh, commercial world, but you also have to appreciate the beauty and all of that that's all around you. So great book uh, choice. Um, so yeah, explain then a little bit about this vision. So you said you're not a technical person, yet you were an analyst and working for an e-commerce person. So you must be at least a little bit technical. Um, do you have some skills in the area? I mean, I am a nerd, okay. so that's what I am. I like to understand the way the world works. Mm-hmm. And so for me, like in high school, I made it my mission to read every book on the Barnes & Noble's classic literature list wow. for fun. No way. Yeah. Um, so I would just do stuff like that. You know what I mean? And then beyond that, it's like when I went to go study political science, I really like to understand geopolitical systems, how do political, like how do institutions work? How do they interrelate? Um, what are different players or agents within the space? Um, And then moving into the startup world, it's really understanding how are companies built, how are businesses built, um, how do consumers think consumer and customer, ultimately psychology. Um, And so for me as an analyst and also working in marketing, I would say all of those skills translate because as an analyst, what you're really looking at is you're analyzing massive sets of data to draw insights and draw conclusions. And so a lot of that has to do with elements of psychology. Um, And then when it comes to marketing as well, it's the same thing. You're doing user personas, customer profiling, and then mapping that back to um, a marketing plan to to ultimately tap into that. One of the books that I read really early on was Hooked. Oh, nice. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. It's an amazing book. And it really, really dives into the depths of how companies uh, understand user psychology and tap into it a lot of times for negative ways. Mm. And so to me, it's always been interesting. So it's like, okay, well, you know, a lot of these companies do things like this negatively. Um, what would it look like if we use some of this stuff in, in a positive light? But to your point, um, I like to understand things. And so, yes, I can be technical. I did teach myself to code when I decided to start my company. I didn't right. code the product, right. but I think it's important to understand the ins and outs of how everything is made, even if you're not making it yourself. Mm-hmm. You need to understand the process. And that goes back to the alchemist, right? It's it's learning to love the journey, not just the end destination. Mm-hmm. So you really need to understand each of the different parts of the journey to get to the end destination. Yep. And, and Hooked is the book that talks about virality and the K factor, right? And he uses LinkedIn as an example, exactly. like whether something catches on or not. And mm-hmm. for example, this podcast is going to catch on because you're going to be so blown away that you're going to tell all 10 of your friends. Exactly. And they're going to go like, yes, yes. we need a part of this. It's a super secret club. It's the new Soho house. Um, no, okay. So that's so you've always had an interest in sort of business and maybe the potential of what these things could be. Um, and then you said, okay, I'm going to make a virtual reality company and you're going to make a virtual reality company talking specifically about DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion. So what prompted this space? Why did you think that there was a gap in this space? Why did you think that virtual reality was the medium to achieve your goals in this space? 
Well, initially I wanted to start actually with sexual assault training for uh, collegiate, the collegiate space, so mm -hmm. universities. And then my friend, and I'm just being super, you know, blunt, my friend came to me and was like, Morgan, uh, you need to start where there is a very clear business model and where there's an easier in. And that's okay. going to be the corporate space. And so I was like, okay, well, you know, first I was like, no. And then I was like, mm, he's right. You know what I mean? And there's a lot of red tape when you look at things like Title IX within the collegiate space. And there's just a lot of, you know, it's really difficult to get in. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the topics that we train on are heavily polarizing because they're so politicized. Yeah. as is ultimately everything, not just the things that we train on. Whatever you talk about. <laughs> Literally. Totally cool. yeah. yeah. Do you like water? <laughs> Every word on the show is yeah. politics, no matter yeah. what. Do you, you like think... water? Okay, so what side are you on? Oh, no, really? Kidding. I bet you do. Yeah. 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 The, you would say that. Exactly, right? So it's like, unfortunately, that's how everything is. But, you know, when I was looking at Title IX, I was like, okay, well, that's going to be really difficult. There's a lot of red tape there. And so ultimately we decided to move into anti-harassment training okay. and it's similar, but different, if that makes sense. Um, and it's also something that's regulated. So there's a clear use case, a clear business model. There's a clear entry point in, and there's a clear way that technology can come in and augment it to help support learning objectives that create a better outcome and create a better future. And when I initially had the idea, it was before hashtag me too. Mm -hmm. And so everyone thought it was crazy because it was back when there were like standalone computers mm -hmm. and like the, you literally had to put up sensors to do room scale VR. And so everyone was like, Morgan, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I was kind of forced into the choice in some ways because really? it was like, are you, well, yeah. Because it was like, are you going to pursue your dream? Or are you going to keep your job? And I was like, I'm going to pursue my dream. So I was kind of like a little bit forced into it. But when I quit my job and I moved across the country. And again, it's like the alchemist, you know, the universe will, this is my belief, but the universe will um, sometimes respond to that, right? So I moved across the country, quit my job, and then hashtag me too started to unfold. Hmm. And all of a sudden we started getting, so 151 press outlets, like literally I had a time when I was landing on a plane in San Francisco and I picked up my phone. I never answer calls. I don't know. And it was a reporter from Bloomberg who like randomly just You're called like, my uh, number. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I was like, I mean, I guess I'll take it. I'm <laughs> no, kind of tired. Just, yeah. I mean, I'm on a plane right now, but <laughs> what's up? <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah. So you, you I guess right place at the right time. You know, I quit my job and I did something in a, and then I just asked for a sandwich, and uh, I didn't even get that. So, you know, pro, it's, yeah. it's different for each individual. No, so kidding. let's go no. talk to Paulo Coelho. No. No, no, yeah, kidding. that book is... <laughs> yeah. 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 But, yeah, we, okay, so me too. There's obviously these greater factors. And we know that a lot of companies have DEI requirements, and that's yeah. the thing now. Um, I'm reading a lot of these old books, and I actually brought this. I'm reading this book right now, Hard Drive, from Bill Gates, uh, The Story of the Making of the Microsoft Empire. I'm actually listening it. Not that I'm on a billionaire kick, but I'm listening to the new Walter Isaacson, Elon Musk book, and you're kind of getting, because he's a crazy and interesting figure, yeah, right? So I'm just in this billionaire zone, and the common trait that they share, also Steve Jobs, is that they're all assholes, right? And there was this point in 1985, it was all guys who built Microsoft, and a woman came in because they wanted to get government contracts. So like, oh, we need some women in the company to get these contracts. So they had two token women come in. And a woman comes in and she tells all the people, hey, I hope you guys are you know, improving at your work. I hope you love what you're doing. I want to make this a better place to come in to work. And everybody in the company looks at her like, you're crazy because all they've done so far is just scream at us and tell us to work a 100-hour week. So she didn't fit in. And then she was actually ousted a year later, right? So from 1985 to now, we've come a long way. But I think we still sort of idolize these people who are just assholes. And we believe like, oh, to build a Microsoft, to build a SpaceX or a Tesla, you have to be a jerk. You have to have these toxic cultures. Um, how do you think we fight that, knowing, of course, that everything's political? <laughs> like, How do we combat that perception? Well, I think what's interesting, and this is just my initial reaction to that, but what's interesting is that a lot of times the founders that we idolize that end up being jerks are the ones that are sometimes the loudest. And it's like for as many reference points of billion dollar companies and billion dollar founders where the founder is a jerk, 
I know many founders who have built billion dollar companies that are leading with empathy or who are very aligned internally and who try to be very self-aware, very open-minded and, and just very compassionate, both men and women, but they're not necessarily the ones that are in the headlines every day. And so I think there's two elements that come to mind here. And one is a lot of times, you know, again, I think the the ones who are jerks tend to, in some ways, almost be the loudest. Um, whereas there are, and, and that also is an element of media. I think that, you know, there's a lot to be said about how media plays on our emotions and it plays on fear. And ultimately not, even though media coverage is supposed to be fair reporting, as fair and transparent as outlets try to be, it's still most of the times not fair and transparent, right? And so if what people want to read about is they want to read about these stories or they want to read about things that are emotionally charged and emotionally compelling, and that's what ends up getting a Netflix TV show, that's what ends up getting a book deal, that's what ends up, you know, um, becoming what's idolized in Silicon Valley or whatever it may be, then those are the stories we're going to repeatedly hear, even if there is this entire world that exists outside of that. And where people so, are reasonable and they say, yeah. yeah, you can take a couple weeks off for paternity leave. Yeah, <laughs> it's not like, a horrible no, thing. No, it's not I the have, end of the world. Exactly. I have so many friends who've actually built billion dollar companies and they're not like that. You mm. know, they're just not on Netflix TV shows. Are they the richest people in the whole world? I mean, they're very rich. For are they sure. the richest? Um, they're top, like, See, top, and they're losers. But yeah, they're you're losers. Right, yeah, if you're yeah. not the if literal not, richest person in the world, you failing. are a loser, right? Yeah, it's okay, all good. about money. Okay, I'm gonna See, go home and reevaluate. Yeah, priorities. because at the beginning of this, you said, yeah. I want, ooh, I want impact. I want yeah. the biggest impact yeah. possible, right? Yeah. But that's not the question you should be asking. You should be asking, uh, how do I make the most money? Forget impact, yeah. forget legacy, forget biographies. Yeah, just but, money, 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 money. That's it. But the thing I would argue is that. You know, so there's the richest, like the top 100 richest, but I think that there's also a time scale capacity, like there's a time scale to that, right? And so the thing that I've seen is a lot of my friends who have built billion dollar companies are in their early 40s, late 30s, mid 40s, whatever it may be, and this is their first company. And so what you see with Elon Musk is he started with, uh, I forget, Zipex or whatever. He started actually Zip with like, two. yeah, that <laughs> yeah. one. Yeah. And then he went over to um, PayPal. Then he went to SpaceX, and now he's at you know Twitter, which is now X, which is you know in its own precarious situation. Um, but he's built multiple companies, right? And so yes, Bill Gates built Microsoft, um, but at the same time, a lot of times, I would say that that's kind of like the narrative of the past because that was really in the dot com boom, and I don't necessarily see a dot-com boom coming up unless we were to look at maybe AI, but AI is still pretty nascent, right? So um, I don't know that we'll have that many Bill Gates coming up. I think that a lot of the future profiles of people who are the richest in the world are going to model out people who are serial entrepreneurs, less so than somebody who does like a one-time make it or break it market take all winner. Yeah. Work a hundred hours a week and forget everything else. No time to shower, no time for anything. Yeah. No, we're going to um, build the showers in the office. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Just yeah. like five minutes. Yeah. That's all it takes, guys. Yeah, it's efficient. Like, just like it's your behind hair. your office. It's yeah. not that hard. Um, <laughs> apparently, it is that hard. Okay. So you've, you've partnered with brands like Ikea and you know, obviously, like we said, media outlets, but you've been partnering with some pretty big brands. So what is the experience that you're trying to bring to people with what you're doing? And, mm -hmm. and you know, if I put on the headset, the VR headset, what is the experience that you want me to have that I'll learn empathy or I'll learn some of these soft skills, mm -hmm. as you call them? Yeah, so one thing, and my dad is a Trump supporter, interior instructor. He thinks I'm an activist. Okay. Yeah, and then my mom, you know, is a liberal Democrat. Okay. So my mom's oh. black, my dad's white. <laughs> that's an unusual pairing. <laughs> yeah, okay, so that's also right. part of why I started the company. Yeah. Um, a large part of why I started the company. And so growing up in that environment, I realized that our we all have our own different life experiences, right? And so your reality is not invalid because it's different from my reality and vice versa. My reality doesn't just not exist. It's not real. It's not not real because it's different from yours. Yeah. And so we can have two completely different sets of life experiences and have to honor the fact that people have different experiences in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And so ultimately the role that we play is, is 
building the bridge and creating the space for people to really have some of that reflection. Um, and ultimately, you know, transparently, I used to be very different than I am now. Mm -hmm. Like I used to not support gay rights. And then I had a friend mm -hmm. in Europe who was like, Morgan, why don't you support gay marriage? And I was like, I don't know. She was like, no, but like really Morgan, why don't you support gay marriage? And she really pushed me. And I grew, I, you know, realized I grew up in North Carolina. I grew up with very religious parents. Um, I grew up going to church every Sunday and religion also a lot of times plays into this too. It's not just politics, it's right. religion. And a lot of the history of our country was created based on religion. So there's like so many interwoven factors that we have to consider. Um, and I used to not believe in some of the things that I believe in now. And so for me to, and it's not about necessarily coming in and saying like, hey, your opinions are wrong and we're going to change right, you, right. right? But it's creating the space for people to question and to propose different realities where people can reflect and say, does this still ring true to me, right? Do I, do I still agree with this? And do I actually agree with this? And are there potentially other realities or avenues that I haven't explored or had the opportunity to explore. And that's something that virtual reality is uniquely posed to do because you can actually take someone and transport them into like different narratives, right? Different uh, so you get walks to experience of life. what something is like. You say, exactly. hey, if you were in this position, this exactly. is how it feel like. Do you want to be in that position? I mean, just assuming it. Yeah. Point, or, or just like, if you're in this position, this is what it feels like. And now that you're in that position, right? you may still walk away and be like, nope, I still believe the same thing. But do you still believe the same thing? Or is there space for there to be multiple perspectives or opinions or realities that exist? And can you grow from that, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we can all grow. I think we all have room to reflect. What so. a powerful thought. I mean, that was the first, that's the reason why I'm actually drawn to your story and why I was drawn to your company is precisely that thinking. Because when we think about virtual reality, we think of avatars and Zoom calls and all this kitschy, weird bullshit that doesn't really make sense. We think, oh, I don't want to have this three pound thing on my head every day at work. And I don't want, a lot of it is scary to a lot of people. And you say, like, oh, that's the end of the real world. But I do think that the power to achieve empathy and to literally see the world through somebody else's eyes, that's got to be one of the most profound and interesting applications of this technology. And so when I saw your company, that was the first thing I thought. I was like, oh, what a cool idea. And obviously people resonated right away almost because you're very young in terms of the company and you've had big partnerships and a lot of coverage. So um, something like 90% of the people who've taken your program experience some kind of shift. So yeah. Yeah, and we we measure that in different ways. And one of the ways that we like to measure it is even when you're not aware of why something might be discrimination, bias, harassment, whatever it is, do you feel uh, more empowered or more able to support a colleague who's going through the experience, right? And so it's, you know, there's a lot of focus on training people around you know, hey, this is what bias looks like, or hey, this is harassment, or hey, this is, don't do this, this is wrong, right? And that's that's important. It's important to know, right, what's right, what's wrong, and create the safe space for that, too, because we have a lot of cancel culture. So create the safe space for people to be wrong and for people to not know. But then at the same time, it's, you may not always know why it's wrong or specifically what's wrong. And ultimately, the other thing we have to consider is there's a lot of cultural differences and cultural nuances, right? So something that's appropriate in one culture is perceived completely inappropriately in another culture, right? Um, and so there's a lot of nuance within that, but it's even if I don't know why this is wrong or why this is bad, do I feel more empowered to show up for my colleagues or show up for somebody when they're impacted by it? Do I feel more empowered to have the conversation, hold space, ask them how I can support them, whatever that may be? Because ultimately, if we can do that, right, then we can actually shape the way that people interact because we're ultimately focusing on inter and intrapersonal skills. Yeah. And I think what you said about having multiple cultures as parents or multiple different uh, points of view. One thing that I've noticed, and you know, as a result of looking the way that I look, people often assume that I have values. For example, if I go into the South, people will assume that 
I have a certain set of values because I look a certain way, even though I don't. I'm not going to say which one. Uh, <laughs> everybody already knows. Uh, but so sometimes people will say like, hey, you know, they should really get all that stuff out of our schools because they shouldn't teach kids. I have a kid who's in school and I think, what's the harm? Let them read every book possible. But people yeah. assume they just project these things. So I get to hear a lot of that. And I could pass, for lack of a better word, in either camp, right? And one thing that I've noticed is that we tend to... We don't really talk to each other when we have arguments with people. If you actually ask somebody, somebody says, like, I'm upset about this, and you engage them and you say, why are you upset about this? They will tell you stuff, and very quickly that will morph into something else. It'll mm -hmm. morph into, it's like, I don't think we should teach certain kinds of things to children. Okay, when should we teach it? When they're in middle school, it's like, okay, I, all right, so it's about lines and age. Okay, cool. But I'm really upset about the fact that there's so much crime and cars are being broken into in San Francisco. And Demo and it, the conversation always just migrates into something else. And you think, okay, well, all of us are worried about safety. All of us are worried about crime. All of us are. So we're not really talking to each other on these issues. We each have viewpoints, and I think we each have things that are important to us. And we're just, this is more important to me, and this is more important to you. Even if we might agree on a lot of stuff, but like we're portraying it as we're enemies. And the truth is that we're not really enemies. You're just kind of focusing on this, and I'm kind of focusing on that. And we ultimately have different ways that we want to achieve it, right? That's, right. that's fundamentally what it is, is ultimately... I think a lot of people want the same thing, the same outcome for the most part, right? But we disagree on the way to achieve that. Right. And I, I think a lot of times for me, when it comes to understanding somebody else who, and, and the other thing that I'm thinking as you say that is a lot of times we listen to respond. We don't listen to hear. <laughs> no, and, like, I want to tell you about San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me talk to you about the homeless problem. Yes. You don't know it's the homeless out of control. problem. I do. Democrats are ruining everything. I do. Yeah. Right. And so, like, it's one of those things where we're listening to respond and right. we're formulating our argument and we're formulating what we're going to say. And we already know what we say, what we want to say. And we already know that we want the other person to agree with us. And if they don't agree with us, then they're wrong and yeah. they have something that they need to learn and blah, blah, blah. Right. All of these things. And I think the challenge for a lot of people, but if everyone could do it, the world would be right. very different, um, is taking a step back and really understanding where is this person coming from? And so that's the thing that I always try to do when someone has beliefs or views that are different from mine, is I try to take a step back and I say, like, where is this person coming from? Like, what's your background, right? Like, where, how were you raised? Like, what, what were your childhood experiences? What formulated that train of thought where this is why you think this is the way to achieve it. And so I think if everyone can do that, because if I can do that, then I can have compassion, even if I don't agree with you and your perspective and how you want to go about achieving something, I can have compassion for why I might, you know, think that something is, you know, more or less ignorant or more or less close-minded or more or less, you know, one avenue versus another, whatever it may be. Like I can have compassion for, your perspective and your understanding. And then if you can do that with mine, we can actually have a conversation around, hey, right? Like ultimately, maybe we all do want the homeless problem to go away. But again, we have like very different perspectives different, on how to achieve yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Different ideas of how we might solve that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So it's it's really like understanding somebody else's background and how right. that's filtering what they're saying. I think it's very powerful that you have admitted that you have personally changed. I think it's nice that you're able to be vulnerable like that because that's one of the biggest problems is that we're not able to admit that we might change our viewpoints or yeah. that we were wrong about something. I know that my viewpoints changed. I went to a very liberal arts college and I used to toss around words. I mean, I'll just say it. I was like, oh, that's gay or something like that because yeah. all my friends were doing that, right? And it wasn't until I was in college when people would, you know, kind of drill down on me that, hey, that you're using that word, do you really mean to use that word yeah. to, to, to say that's bad? And I had a lot of learning that I had to do in growth that I had to do over the, over the years to figure that kind of stuff out. But I think you're right that creating a space where people can be wrong but not vilified, where they're able to sort of correct. And then you say, okay, here's a headset. You, you experience that. How do you feel now? And letting somebody recognize, oh, I see, maybe maybe the way that I thought about handling a situation like this in the past isn't perhaps the best way to handle it. Yeah. And people are fluid too, you know? And so that was something that somebody said to me was she said when she, and she was actually, you know, they're a client, but she's also somebody that 
I just enjoy, you know, we were getting dinner, catching up. And she was like, you know, when I had my kids, my views changed. Sure. When I got married, my perspective changed. So we go through all of these transformational life experiences that will change our views ultimately, right? Like your your views when you have children probably aren't going to be the same as the views that you have when you're single and living alone in your mid-30s, right? And so yeah. it's leaving the space not only for others, but also for yourself to recognize that your views are fluid and your perspective is fluid and it's going to change over time. And I think a lot of times we hard code in you are this way now, or you were this way before. And I think also, you know, social media platforms and, um, you know, media and all of these different things. Once you put a perspective out there, it's like, you have to commit to that it's forever. Permanent. Yeah, forever. Yeah, you're, you're done. Like that's You had that perspective 10 years ago. 1990. Right? That's like, who you are. Uh, it's yeah. like, what? Yeah, 30, I don't even remember 30. 30 years. Yeah. No, you're not allowed to change. Yeah, you know? And right. so it's, yeah. You've learned nothing since Yeah, then. exactly. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, and I think instead we should prioritize allowing people to learn and grow and change their perspective rather than forcing people and ourselves to lock into whoever we were, whatever it is that we believed. Because even, you know, some beliefs that I have now might be different from beliefs I had four years ago, right? And that's great. That's a sign of growth, in my opinion. Yeah, I think you're right. And you're experiencing a lot of humanity as they interact with your product. So you're also learning from the feedback of, oh, what am I seeing in the real world? And I think that feedback step is so important. Um, so talk to me about that transition because this is the most fascinating part for a lot of people. Many people wish to do something. Maybe they have some sort of desire to make an impact, but they don't really know how, or they're very afraid of taking the leap to do something which you have done. So talk to me about that transition moment from the fear of quitting your job going all in on this and also physically moving. How did you get through those first few months? How were the early days of your business? Did you have outside investors or did you get a client right away? How did you make that happen? We got into an accelerator. It took us some time. Everybody, it was hard to get investors or clients when you had no product and no team and just an idea. Mm -hmm. um, but to answer your question around fear, it's very challenging to overcome your fear, but it's the most rewarding thing that you'll ever do. Because once you do it once, you know you can do it again. And once you do it multiple times, you can do it repetitively. And it's one of those things where, you know, when it comes to fear, especially when like quitting your job, starting a company, focusing on your side project, whatever it may be, you really just have to go all in. Like I heard this rap song, I listen to all genres of music. <laughs> But I heard this rap song and I forget the lyrics. I'm totally going to butcher them. But it was like, whenever I get in my head that I have doubts, then I go hard, then it works out. Right. And yeah. so it's like, you have to literally feel the fear. It's, you know, common cliche, but feel the fear and do it anyway. So like, you can't get in your head. You literally have to say like, okay, this is my goal and I'm going to go all in and I'm going to do it. And then if it doesn't work out, then what's the worst case scenario? You're going to be right back where you were before maybe a little bit worse, you'll get back to where you were before, but at least you know you tried, right? And a lot of times I think when you really go hard on yourself and you really bet on yourself, then momentum starts to happen, but you can't give up too early. And I think a lot of times people want you to give up too early. The thing that I say is when people say you can't do something, it's them projecting their fears onto you. Right. Because a lot of people are too scared to pursue their dreams or too scared to go all in. And a lot of times people are also subconsciously, they don't want to see you achieve your dreams because it's going to be a mirror back to them. That of, they did it wrong. Yeah, of the fact that they- But they made a mistake. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And so when you hear other people talking to you, you have to just like zone it out. And something that I did really early on was I was like, all motivational videos all the time. Okay. You did. <laughs> I'm like, I'm dead serious. Well, Gary yeah. Vee mode. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, like YouTube, like motivational, you know, yeah. like you versus you, wake up, hustle, grind, blah, 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 you know, which I think again, like ties to some of like the hard drive like, yes. mentality. I balance it though. I like to meditate. So, not, you know, right, right. I'm very into like my internal state, mm -hmm. but I would listen to motivational videos and I would just be like, you know what? This person said this thing or this person's questioning me and I'm going to put on a mo motivational video and I'm going to work and I'm just going to see what happens. And I think also taking a playful approach of like, you have one life. So it's kind of like a see what happens approach, you know, mm -hmm. like let's try it. Let's see what happens. And worst case is you're back where you started. Yeah. 
I love that approach. Uh, what was your first big break? What was the first time where you felt, oh, okay, this is maybe going to work out? I think I'll tell you, but I think we create our big breaks. So I, when I started my company, again, I taught myself how to code because I like had no idea how to start the company and get it out there. So I was like, okay, well, I have to get into like the rooms of people who are in VR. And if I'm going to go into a room of people who are in VR, I have to know about VR. <laughs> I can't just be like, hey, I'm starting a VR company and I don't know how, you know. Or you have to bring donuts and yeah, just say your Yeah, food. that's true. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, actually, marshmallows because we're in LA. Right, yeah, right. I'm just kidding. I like marshmallow it. donuts. Full circle. Yeah, exactly. Full circle, yeah. yeah literally. <laughs> um, you know, so I learned how to code and I took a ton of Udacity courses and then I went to hackathons and I started like pitching the idea. And I really just wanted to hear how other people perceive the engineers perceive the idea and how they would go about building it, what they thought about it, etc. But then at the same time, I'm the type of person where I'm like, again, you have one life. So who cares? It's better to apologize for something then, you know, not do it. So I literally started reaching out to people on LinkedIn. This was something I actually did before this. Mm -hmm. I like reached out to the president of one of the largest marketing and communications companies one time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hey, can you mentor me? <laughs> and he actually mentored me. I'm serious. Wow. And they're like one of the largest. It was in WWPR. And they actually, he mentored me. He took my call and he started setting up monthly calls with me. So I, when I was entering into VR, just started reaching out. I looked up lists of like the top thought leaders in VR, like the top 100 women in VR, the top 100 founders in VR. And I reached out to all of them on LinkedIn. I was like, will you give me 15 minutes of your time? Mm -hmm. And then I made my questions super curated and super focused on specifically what they did. So if they were a product background, why did you choose to publish on the Steam store? Why did you choose to architect it in this way? If they came from like a go-to-market background, okay, so how do you view consumer adoption, right? So make your questions super focused. Um, and when I did that, what I ended up finding was that a lot of, you know, again, my big breaks started happening. I'll walk you through my biggest break, but the breaks in were people who I reached out to to be, you know, to mentor me on 15 minute phone calls were like, hey, come to this conference. Then I would go to the conference and I would like be invited to a private dinner with Oculus, right? And then I forget, like I met the co-founder of Oculus mm. it, indirectly, like through that, right? Or I would be invited to um, an event with like, where inside the event, like it would be like the, the box or the suite of a sports event. And inside the box was like, the somebody who's best friends with the co-founder of AOL and his daughter right. is one of the Harvey Weinstein people. And so all of the things just kind of connected. So yeah. that's what I mean is like, you really just have to go out and yeah. put yourself out there. And so then if my, somebody invites you to something, you just say, yes. Exactly. Yeah. If an opportunity presents itself, you got to go. Exactly. And it might cost you money and you might not know if you're going to get anything out of it, but you have to sort of take those micro leaps as well, it sounds like. Yeah. And when you go with the idea of I'm going to get something out of this, usually you don't get things out of it. So you have to go with the idea of you know, no matter what, this is going to add value in some way. Mm. And the value could be you learn something really interesting from a panel that mm. you end up incorporating into your product, or the value could be you meet somebody amazing who ends up like opening doors for you. Yeah. Um, but people can sense when you're wanting to go just to, to get value. And that seems transactional. So a lot of times that'll block a lot of meetings and a lot of conversations and calls. Um, but that being said, my first big break was like, when hashtag me too finally took off. And again, I was like implementing my strategy. I just told you about, so Rose McGowan follows me on Instagram because I reached out to her on Instagram. I was okay. like, yeah. hey, <laughs> I'm starting a company. And like, you should follow me and we should, you know, talk. She was like, yeah, I'm interested in talking. This was like during the middle of Harvey Weinstein stuff. Um, and I just kept doing that with other people. And then all of a sudden, um, and I was doing press pitches, all of a sudden I got us into, I forget, the publications before, but Wired, and we got print and digital, like pre-product. And I was like the yeah. person of the month and the cover of the magazine is Trump. It was like the Trump issue. <laughs> and right. yeah. yeah, no, yeah. no, but it was like amazing. So it's like print and digital coverage. And yeah. like, I'm in like the newsstands that, I mean, of like no, an airport. Yeah. yeah, it's like really it's big. Huge. We're like pre-product, right? Mm -hmm. And then from that, um, we got into Vogue. We got into all of these other publications. And then from that, we ended up getting all of these inbound uh, leads for clients. And then from that, we ended up fundraising. And then from that, we built the product. Cool. So 
What an amazing story. You know, side note, I don't know if I'm allowed to share this story or not, uh, but I got jury duty relatively recently and there was a camera crew, this is LA, mm -hmm. and I was going in and there's just a bunch, it was a media circus coming into the courtroom and all of that. And I didn't know where I was going. And as I walked through, I heard some attorney say, these are the Weinstein jurors. And I was like, oh, mother. <laughs> <laughs> and then I found out that it was the same building, the same floor. There were two different cases, and I had maybe a 50-50 chance of being on that jury. And I thought, oh, my <laughs> God, please don't. <laughs> like, I cannot be unbiased in this case. It's impossible. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that was a real close call there. Um, that's what happens when you live in this magical, crazy city, I guess. Um, yeah. But, yeah, such powerful insights. So you, you spent a lot of your time networking. Do you... Or how much time in a given day did you spend reaching out to people on these platforms? Is yeah. that most of the work? Well, it's interesting. So you call it networking. I don't consider it networking. Okay. And I think that's where a lot of people fail is networking is, again, really transactional. And nobody wants a transactional conversation. Nobody wants to feel like you're coming to them literally with the intent of getting something out of it. And I think that's why, you know, people will open more doors for you if you're less concerned about the desire for them to open doors and you genuinely just want to learn from them. And so that's why I don't like conferences because I don't like, you know, the like, here's my business card. Here's like, let's do a 30 minute meeting. Let's run through. What do you do? What can you do for me? What can I do for you? Whatever. Um, and so I take a very relationship driven approach where, and I'm also like very knowledge driven because at the end of the day, even if you're not doing anything for me, what can I learn from you? Because you're obviously doing something right and you yeah. obviously know more than I do. So in the early days, that was like primarily what I was doing. I was just reaching out to people. I was like, hey, who should I be talking to? What should I be learning? How should I be building this? Um, and and that's it. Like, how would you approach this? If you were me, guide me and give me advice. And then outside of that, I was also like pitching the press. So again, I had a friend who worked in marketing and PR on the PR side. I worked in marketing too, but she was on the PR side. And she taught me how to write a press pitch. And I literally Googled like press lists and there were like all of okay. these like leaked press lists online. Ooh, okay. Yeah, like leaked press lists online. And so, and then you can also use like email scraping tools. I worked in marketing, so I know this like email scraping tools. Hunter.io. So like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> scrap, scrap. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah, and like find like, you know, publicist emails sure. from LinkedIn. And then I wrote PR pitches and like, I would just do it. And the thing, the other thing is it's all about perceived momentum until you have momentum because people like momentum, right? Like once you're going, you're going. And so you have to give the perception of momentum if you don't have momentum yet. And so I would do like these yeah. cadence press pitches, like literally awesome. again, when I had like no product, no nothing. And I was like, hey, we're starting this company. Hey, we have like a new advisor on board. Hey, we just secured this, hey, whatever. And like anything you can do, whatever. And then again, once we did all of that, we got into the accelerator program. It was actually about building the product. It was actually about finding customers. It was actually about, you know, them building the, an iteration of the product based off of the feedback we got from our customers. Then it was about aligning our, our, our product to the go-to-market and customer fit. Um, and then it was about, you know, building new product lines and building new features. So in the early days, it was like all of it because that was how I started. You've given me one great idea. I'm going to rename my podcast the Perception of Momentum Podcast. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Problem yeah. solved. Um, everybody's like, that makes so much sense. No, what what a cool, fascinating story. So for if, if you get your way, what would the best case five years from now? I mean, obviously, you're on a very different trajectory now than you probably thought you were going to be eight years ago. Yeah. Um, best case scenario, what do you imagine happens for you, for your company, for everything? That's interesting. So we... Are, we work with the public sector and we're also working with the private sector as well. Uh, or, you know, we work with the private sector. We're also working with the public sector as well. I would reverse that. Um, and I would say really doubling down on both. Because again, when we think about impact, we think about a one to many. So it's the individuals that we train within companies can then take that out into their communities. And um, we work with, for example, the OECD, so the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, right? They're an NGO that works with the 36 UN member countries. And so that's a really great opportunity for us to be able to create impact in local communities. Um, and then likewise, we work with 
really large companies, as you reference, IKEA, Hyundai, et cetera. Um, I would say, and, and we're actually looking at rolling out new training lines. So we rolled out diversity and inclusion. We actually rolled out two different training lines. So I've lived in Europe twice. I lived in Italy and I lived in Copenhagen. Um, so, and right now we're doing a lot of work with companies in the UK, for example, where the UK is very different from Europe. And so really understanding the nuances there. Um, and I would say for us, it's rolling out additional training lines around some of the different topic areas of impact. Um, but we also measure impact. And so we're looking at, can we improve retention across teams? Can we improve um, self-rank comprehension and also the comprehension scores coming out of our, our program? But I would say at a broader level, it's, you know, again, a one to one million, a one to one billion impact. It's how can we impact local communities from the people that we're training? And it's, can we do that in the public and the private sector, sector not just one or the other? Uh, spoiler alert. I think you can. Yeah. I think you will. I think you're yeah. going on yeah. pace. I think it's going to be great. Yeah. Uh, wow, so many deep bits of wisdom there. I mean, first of all, thanks for coming out uh, and sharing your thoughts and ideas. I'm very impressed, especially hearing your mindset behind all of it. It's incredible what you've been able to achieve. And again, just seems like the right idea for the right time. And it's it's just something that is the merging. And, and I love that line on your website where you talk about, you know, Technology can lead to apathy and can lead to all these negative outcomes. We're seeing that at scale, hugely negative outcomes from social media and tech and all of that. But there's still this positive side that perhaps we're not exploring enough in the headlines. And that's where I come in. I just want to shine a light on stories like this where it's like, okay, how can we use these things to do something that's meaningful? And what does that meaning mean? And that's a very philosophical question, right? If I say, like, let's make the world a better place, then the question is, what does better in what way? You know, how is it going to be better? So I had the most interesting conversation, because again, I love to understand how things work and how people think. And so I was talking to somebody about the writer strikes and the actor strikes in LA and the role that AI is going to play in the creative industry and the way that a lot of roles are going to be augmented and, um, you know, just how people have a lot of fear and what that's going to mean for the landscape in the next five years and like what this person's thoughts were, like what's right versus what's wrong. What do I think what's right versus what's wrong? And it was interesting because I asked, you know, do you believe in universal basic income, right? Which is something that like Switzerland piloted right. a long time ago, <laughs> um, like years ago, but um, they piloted universal basic income. And the question was, okay, well, like the two sides of the coin are, is it going to make people lazy or you know, what we saw in COVID-19 was a lot of people started businesses and a lot of people started companies. With a couple hundred bucks, yeah. <laughs> not even that much money. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like it just gave people the creative space to pursue and do the mm. things that they wanted to do, right? And so this person's perspective was, because I was saying, okay, well, I could see one political party potentially supporting that and the other not. So, and this person's perspective was, I think that we're going to be forced into it. And I was like, you know, well, and I, I'm not project. I'm not predicting the future. I'm just saying, like these look like the conversations I like to have, right? Um, I was like, well, I could see one supporting it and one not. So, how do you think that's going to play out in a political space, right? And he was like, well, I think we're going to be. I don't think we're going to have a choice because so many roles are going to be automated be gone, yeah. that we're going to be forced to offer something like that. Which who knows, like what the next five years looks like if that's actually going to happen. If you know what the skills gap is. A lot of companies are focusing on the skills gap in engineering and you know all of these different things. Um, and we've seen iterations of that in the past where we've gone through like the industrial re revolution and you know elder generations having to learn technology and all of these different things. Um, but ultimately, you know, going back to your question and make the world a better place, it's you know, okay, well, what is making the world a better place look like? Right. And and what is what do I envision the world looking like in five years, 10 years, 15 years? And let's also keep in mind, um, there's a really interesting book that says we we like to predict that we're going to move a lot faster than we do. And so by now, like 20 years ago, we thought we were going to have like flying spaceships right. and, you know, holograms running our our apartments, sure. our houses. Um, and we don't. And so. Yes, there's an element of technology moves very fast, but there's also an element of technology moves very slow. And so it's balancing the two and really thinking about like at the core fundamental, what are our values and and building intentionally and, and carving that intentionally when we have the opportunity to. 
Yep, that's right. And we think that AI is going to want to take over the world, for example, but maybe it just wants enough money for cigarettes and booze. We just maybe have to figure just, out yeah. what cigarettes and booze are to AI. Yeah, maybe it <laughs> just wants go. to be like a top, you know, 100 uh, wealthiest person. Yeah, in the world. exactly. Yeah. Not, the, not the number one. Maybe yeah. it just wants its own island, and that's cool. I um, mean, AI is the collective human consciousness. So I wouldn't uh, yeah. be surprised if it just wanted to be the top 100 wealthiest person in right. the world. Right? I, I'm going for an island. If it's good enough for Mark Zuckerberg, <laughs> yeah. it's good enough yeah. for AI. Just a yeah, beautiful exactly. island and a view. You know, there's yeah. a camera on a beach somewhere. Yeah. Just point it out at the ocean, and it's going, this is nice. Yeah. This is pretty sweet. Yeah. yeah. I don't want and this I, to be smog and gray look, and I haze. think the collective human consciousness would agree with you. Okay. Give me an island. All right. <laughs> gotcha. yeah, exactly. Well, soon enough, you know, you're on your way. Um, well, yeah, as we wrap up, so I guess, like, can you distill for the TikTok crowd, what is your life philosophy in 30 seconds, and then we'll close it out? Yeah, that's interesting. What's my life philosophy? So I, that's a good one. My life philosophy is, again, make your life worth writing about. That's the one that I always come back to. And I'm an idealist at heart. So it's, again, from the world of idealism, what does that look like outside of the confines of what you know, like the the framework and perception? So to go back to your podcast name, like, you know, off the Perception of momentum. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Beat the often path. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. To go back to to beat the often path, it's we see these paths, but there's all of these other paths that we've yet to uncover, that we've yet to explore, or like that poet says, I forget the poet's name, but I took the road less traveled. Exactly by, uh, that one, right? Yes. So there's so many paths that only few have walked, right? right. And so it's um, make your life worth writing about and think about being an idealist yeah. in the sense of what do the other paths look like and how can I create a world that doesn't necessarily exist in the way that I already see it? Well, then I have one final question for you. If I took out the Waldo, how many Ralph Emersons do you know? If I said Ralph Emerson, would you not understand who I'm talking about? Because everybody always says that quote, Ralph Waldo Emerson says, how so often do we use somebody's middle name? Never. Um, so to that point, I'm actually the worst with names. Okay. <laughs> if you haven't noticed, no, I'm such a face person. So like literally I'll go up to somebody and I'll be like, I met you seven years ago at this place wow. and we talked about this. And they'll be like, whoa. And it's like, you know, literally I can meet you once and I'll remember you forever. But I'm the worst with names and I've had to use like Min, min monic, whatever the thing is, Mnemonic. like yeah, that one. All of these like different like weird tools to like remember yeah. people's names. I'm like, okay, imagine like you know, say the name three times. Like imagine whatever, blah blah blah. Um, so to answer your point, a million because in my world, whether his middle name is in there or not, it would be the <laughs> same person. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> It'd be the same person to me. So. so the opposite. Somebody comes up to me, they're like, dude, I was the best man at your wedding, man. And I'm like, uh, Steve? That's I want to so say Steve. Funny. I'll literally like go up to people in a restaurant and like hug them. I'm like, yeah, I met you three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. They're like, this is awkward. <laughs> They're like, that was a great burning man. Um, <laughs> really yeah. powerful. Yeah. Well, thanks, Morgan. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for making the trip. Um, uh, yeah, incredible stuff. I look to you with admiration, and I will continue to support you from afar, or now not so from afar. <laughs> since you're just, Don't worry, I'll say hi to you in a road. restaurant. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> and uh, with that, official podcast is over. over.